So as people are joining us, uh, welcome to the Expanding Empathy Speaker Series uh, 2023 through the Rock Ethics Institute here at Penn State. Um, this is the fifth year we've hosted the series uh, through the Moral Agency and Moral Development Initiative at the Rock. Um, this is funded by them in support with the Department of Philosophy and the Department of Psychology as well. Um, just by way of intro, the, the general goal of the series is to you know, bring uh, renowned scholars from around the world to talk about empathy and moral decision making um, and from a variety of perspectives. And one of the things that we started doing last year was a new panel-based format where we would have a philosopher and a psychologist each give a talk on a common theme of some kind and then have the chance to have interdisciplinary dialogue with each other. And so we're continuing, to, we're going to replicate that uh, this year. Um, and I'm very excited to start us off with a pair of scholars who do some really fascinating work on empathy and morality in the context of animals and human-animal interactions. Um, so the format will be, basically, we'll have the two talks. There'll be a little bit of time for Q&A after each one. Um, if you have questions, uh, make sure to just drop them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of Zoom there. Um, and we'll try to get to them as, as we can. I'll, I'll monitor for that. Um, but then after each talk and after the Q&A for each talk, we'll have a lot more time for open discussion and conversation. And so do make sure to stick around for that. So we have uh, two scholars. We have Dr. Kristen Andrews, um, who is the York Research Chair in Animal Minds and the Professor of Philosophy at York University in Toronto. Uh, she also helps coordinate the Cognitive Science Program and the Greater Toronto Area Animal Cognition Discussion Group. Kristen is on the board of directors of the Borneo Orangutan Society Canada, a member, a member of the College of the Royal Society of Canada, and author of many books um, on social minds, animal minds, and ethics, such as How to Study Animal Minds, and the Animal Mind, an Introduction to the Philosophy of Animal Cognition. Uh, she's published on the question of animal emotion uh, fairly recently in the journal Science, also the Journal of Philosophy of Science, the Journal of the American Philosophical Association, and has received many grants, including from the Templeton World Charities Foundation and the SSHRC in Canada. Uh, Dr. Christoph Dant, who will be talking second, is a reader in psychology and director of graduate studies uh, research in the School of Psychology at the University of Kent in England. Um, he's the founder uh, and director of Shark Lab, dedicated to the study of human intergroup and human-animal relations, and is co-founder of the Society for the Psychology of Human-Animal Intergroup Relations, or the FAIR Society. Um, he's the associate editor for the journal Group Processes and Intergroup Relations, and consulting editor for the European Journal of Personality. And many of his interests include situational and personality factors that drive and sustain intergroup biases, such as ethnic and gender-based prejudice, as well as speciesism. So I want to thank you both for uh, joining us and kicking us off with this. Um, Dr. Andrews will start us off with her talk, and then we will have some Q&A input to Dr. Don. So whenever you are ready. Thank you, Daryl. I'm really happy to be here with everyone, um, and I look forward to having the discussion with you, Christoph, as well. Um, I think we'll have a lot of interesting points of continuity uh, to discuss after our presentations. So let me share my screen. So today I want to talk about um, caring and empathy for animal communities. Um, and I want to start by introducing a concept that has gotten to be very important in, uh, and exciting um, in the development in the sciences of animal behavior in the last 20 years. And this is in the acceptance of culture in other animals. So culture we can understand as socially inherited patterns of behavior and information, including group specific traditions. Um, this was first identified in um, non-human animal groups in Western science in 1999 um, with the identification of group differences between different chimpanzee communities. So pictured here on this slide are some of those differences in the Basso community, uh, chimpanzee community in West Africa, chimpanzees crack nuts on an anvil, but not all chimpanzees in other communities do that. Um, in the middle picture here, this is uh, Julie in the Chimpushi Wildlife Orphanage. Um, it's a chimpanzee sanctuary in Zambia, where you see a dominant uh, female who first started wearing grass in her ear. And this trend took off like high-waisted jeans with all the other 
uh, individuals in our group or most of them copying this grass wearing behavior. You don't really see that anywhere else. Uh, and the third picture here is the community of chimpanzees in Mahale in Tanzania, where chimpanzees hold their hands high over their heads when they groom. So you see, we found that in chimpanzee societies, there are different strokes for different folks. So 23, four years later, we now see it's not just chimpanzees where there's animal culture, but there's culture pretty much everywhere we look in non-human animal species. This is including in humpback whales who have different songs for and different migration routes depending on the community they're in. We see this in capuchin monkeys who use different sorts of tools and who engage in odd social games like finger and eye sockets. Um, we see culture in songbirds, such as savanna sparrows, who have vocal dialects. We see culture in bonobos, who hunt um, animals that look like a squirrel-like rodent in some communities, and antelopes in other communities. Um, we, see, we see culture in fish, such as sticklebacks and minnows, who learn to fear pikes from other group members, and we even see it in fruit flies, who learn preferences for laying eggs in the same material as group members. Um, we see it in bumblebees who learn to pull strings to access food when they observe other bees doing it. So this kind of social learning and, and group differences is something that's widespread in animal, uh, in animal species. And it's what I want to explore today in, in my short presentation is what, why should we care about this, right? What sort of empathy should we have for these animals given that they're cultural, uh, cultural beings? Uh, and not just beings that perhaps feel pleasure and pain um, that we need to look at just on an individual level, but what is important about the groups and culture. Uh, so one of the things that's important here is that when we've got the existence of animal culture, it suggests to us that other animals like humans may evolve via a dual inheritance system. That is, we know that humans have a dual inheritance system and that just like we inherit cult and genetic variants, we also inherit cultural variants that get passed down from one generation to the next. Um, and these variants may increase, decrease, or be neutral with respect to our reproductive fitness. So some of the examples of cultural, uh, cultural variants that were fitness enhancing in humans would be things like herders who evolved lactose tolerance um, or foragers who dive to collect crabs uh, to eat, evolving uh, a bigger lung capacity so they can hold their breath longer underwater. Or um, most famously, when humans started to use fire to cook food, um, we started evolving bigger brains because we then had the calories um, we needed in order to uh, develop in that way. So given dual inheritance, it seems that both biological systems and cultural systems are going to be essential to um, an organism's being, to what that organism is. And if we see animals as uh, cultural beings who might have both biologically and, and, and culturally inherited traditions, um, then we're going to have to be concerned about those cultural traditions as well. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about this in, in first in wild animals and then talk about this in, uh, in captive animals. And so I'll start with this question, is animal culture worthy of our concern in wild animals? Lots of the non-instrumental arguments that we see for preserving wild uh, animal cultural diversity like the argument um, made by the biologist Hal Whitehead, tend to be grounded in a view common among conservationists that biodiversity is worth preserving for its own sake. If wild animal biodiversity is valuable, so goes the thought, then wild animal culture should also be valuable given the premise that biology and culture are inexorably intertangled. The animal culture literature has shown us that cultural behaviors create a niche that become part of an animal's environment, helping to break down this opposition between culture and biology. Thus, if biodiversity is valuable, so is cultural diversity, because these two are not separable in cultural species. You can't preserve one without the other because the culture supports the biological trait 
and the biology supports the cultural trait. But given the importance of culture to animals, creating a biological replica of a cultural animal of de-extinction projects, such as colossal biosciences plan to bring back the woolly mammoth. It might look like they're reproducing the woolly mammoth by, uh, by recreating woolly mammoth's biology from, uh, from cells that they've found, but instead they're creating um, a new animal entirely, one that has the biology of the woolly mammoth and one that will never have the culture of the woolly mammoth because that culture has been lost and is unrecoverable, right? There is nothing you can find in the fossil record. There's no piece of culture that you can use uh, to recreate the, the woolly mammoth culture. Of course, if you put enough woolly mammoths together, they will almost certainly create a new culture. But how hard, like what is that culture going to look like? And, and how hard will it be for those individuals to recover? from the first generation of mammoths who didn't have a same species model to raise them, to learn from, uh, to care for them. Uh, so I think that when we, when we look at projects like this, we have to recognize what would be lost, what we'd be doing by creating uh, these sorts of replicas, biological replicas, and why we shouldn't think of them as actually recreating woolly mammoths along the lines of what existed before, because we can't recreate the culture. In the wild, um, animal culture has already been seen to have many implications for conservation efforts that we, that we already have and for, um, for our desire to protect existing populations. So understanding the role of socially learned practices, in particular subpopulations of endangered species, is already um, going to be vital for conservationists. Knowing what the culture is of this group as opposed to some other group is going to be really important. Um, and destroying animal cultures has resulted in serious incidents of human-wildlife conflict. Of adult and we saw increased um, issues both within the community and with, uh, with human populations as well. So understanding the role of social learning and crop rating elephants may help us to determine how to better mitigate these kinds of human wildlife conflicts. But also culturally vi um, variable behaviors such as migration patterns. Um, are going to be relevant for conservation as well, because it may mean that subpopulations of the same species have different abilities to weather environmental changes caused by climate change or habitat destruction. Likewise, when we think about reintroduction programs um, of existing animals, right? For example, in the case of orangutans, when we have orangutan um, rehab uh, infants and we try to reintroduce them, uh, after training them how to live in, in jungle environments, in their, in their natural forest environments and reintroducing them into the wild, the effectiveness of these sorts of programs may stand or fall on details about the role that cultural knowledge and social learning played in the adaptive success of the original populations and require us to ensure that the reintroduced animals have the requisite knowledge for that particular kind of habitat that they're being introduced into. Um, we see this in efforts to restock northern cod as well, which seem to have um, been undermined by the lack of knowledge of migration routes in the reintroduced animals, which in natural situation would have been passed down to native juveniles from older fish who were key repositories of knowledge and experience. Um, so the, the work on culture, why culture is important and why we should care about culture and wild animals, I think is fairly well established. Um, but I've been thinking lately about the importance of animal culture for captive animals as well. And this reflects some work that I've done with the philosopher Simon Fitzpatrick. So if captive animals also have culture, then it seems our welfare goals and responsibilities are going to have to include considerations of animal culture as well. So do animal, uh, captive animals have cultures? 
Uh, I think clearly they do, right? So captive animals like their wild counterparts are cultural beings. They socially learn from one another. Um, and this is true not just in single species groups, but it's also true in cross species communities uh, where, where non-human animals can learn from other animals that they live with in, for example, the vine sanctuary, which is a, a sanctuary where you have lots of different animals from across taxa as well as species uh, living together. Um, but also in uh, communities like the Yale Monkey Lab or on the Anthony, at the Anthony Keys uh, Ecotourism Resort and Research Center, where you have these communities of animals and humans where uh, they're creating their own interspecies um, uh, cultures, some of which are shared with uh, between the non-human animals and the human caregivers and researchers. So best practices for welfare should require concern for animals' cultural needs. And these needs, I think, and I will argue, are going to be distinguishable from their physiological needs to a certain extent. So for instance, animals can be harmed when cultural capacities and practices that are important to them are impeded or disrupted, whether this is intentionally or unintentionally. Um, and they can be disrupted by things like management practices that are standard in, in caregiving for, of captive animals. Um, this can happen even when the animals are not physically harmed and even when their social relationships remain intact. The relationship between culture and welfare is a complex one. And I think it presents um, really significant challenges for human caretakers and requires us to move beyond some of the standard assumptions about what constitutes and determines welfare uh, for these captive communities. So what are these standard assumptions? Well, there are a lot of different approaches to welfare in the animal welfare literature, but the most common approaches put forward by welfare advocates and organizations tend to emphasize the basic physical health and positive affective states. Several approaches also add some reference to natural or normal behavior. So for example, on this slide, I have here the UK Farm Animals Welfare Council's widely cited five freedoms which lists the following criteria as determinants of good wealth, welf welfare for farmed animals. So you have things like freedom from hunger and thirst, uh, allowing animals ready access to water and, uh, and food needed, freedom from discomfort and giving them appropriate environment, freedom from pain, injury, and disease by preventing disease and treating it when it, when it occurs. Freedom to express normal behavior by giving animals the kind of space they need to engage in species specific activities and freedom from, from fear and distress by ensuring conditions and treatment um, that avoid mental suffering. So I think that culture, if we once we look at culture, we see a certain amount of uh, a conflict between the typical welfare concerns and what we might see as a, a deeper uh, cultural impact on the well-being of captive animals. So I want to briefly talk about four different ways in which I think culture impacts the well-being of captive animals. One is um, not just sociality, but needing sociality of the right kind. Um, also, a look at opportunities for constructing culture and the importance of having such opportunities. I'll look at the kind of epistemic values uh, that exist in creating culture for captive animals and also look at um, different ways of understanding behavior that might normally be described as risky or harmful behavior. So first, just sociality of the right kind. We've known for a long time um, that sociality is important for social animals and the psychologist Harry Harlow's so social isolation experiments with mac macaque monkeys and chimpanzee infants made the need for social contact of an infant to their mother um, extremely apparent. But it isn't just social contact that's needed. Sometimes what's needed is sociality of the right kind. So depending on the species, animals might need social contact with a range of conspecifics who occupy different sorts of roles, roles like stage of life or prestige or expertise. So while mothers often serve as the first point of cultural contact, in many species, same age peers are also important sources of cultural knowledge, as in the case of predator recognition in minnows or the grass wearing in the ears by the sanctuary chimpanzees. 
In other cases, juveniles may acquire cultural knowledge from same sex adults who aren't parents, as in the case of male chimpanzees learning to hunt or female African elephants pictured here learning how to signal sexual re receptivity in their first estrus by having that behavior demonstrated by adult females who aren't in estrus uh, in front of the juvenile. Some cultural species may have a psychological need to pass on cultural information to their offspring or to peers. Depriving captive animals of such opportunities, including opportunities to reproduce and raise their own offspring who they pass on their cultural traditions to, will, will be, I think, of um, ethical significance. Also recognizing interspecies community possibilities Right? So an animal housed without any members of its same species might have the same the right kind of sociality for them, given their history and personality. So this is not an argument that that, for example, um, an elephant that is housed without any other elephants in a zoo requires other elephants in order to fulfill its uh, its cultural behavior because it might have a culture that consists of the other humans around it or other animals who aren't elephants, much in the way the dogs that live in human houses create a culture and a community um, that might not include any conspecifics. So the cultural nature of animals requires consideration of the type and quality of social partners, not just sociality, but sociality of the right types, which is going to be widely variable. Uh, secondly, we think um, it's important that animals, captive animals, have the opportunity to construct cultures when nuns, none are in place. So when it comes to questions about things like environmental enrichment, um, richness of the environment should be regarded as a factor in determining animal welfare. Um, when it comes to the socio-cultural environment and not just the physical environment. So in some cases, enrichment will be puzzle boxes or material to play with. Um, but one thing that might be really useful here is giving objects to the animals that they can use in tandem, that they can use together, or multiple copies of, of objects such as this rice bag, so that a trend of wearing rice bags could spread through the, the community if they chose to do so. Um, the third is the need to recognize the epistemic losses and welfare effects of changing community composition as a result of regrouping, rehousing, and moving individuals from one facility to another, which is common in managing captive situations. So for example, removing older individuals who have had knowledge about rare or less frequent events such as death or seasonality or that caregivers turn over, um, this loss may have significant effects on the overall functioning and welfare of the group leaving naive individuals to start over in an epistemic culture building project. So just as the lack of cultural knowledge on the part of reintroduced animals seems to have been undermined, um, seems to have undermined efforts to do things like restocking the cod or, or helping um, with the orangutan populations in the wild. In the case of captive animals, it seems important that newcomers are provided with opportunities to learn from other knowledgeable information, uh, individuals who exist in that, in that community. Um, fourth, we need to see that sometimes typical welfare concerns are in conflict with supporting animal culture. So for example, consider fighting. Um, fighting is a behavior that might cause discomfort, fear, and distress. That seems to be something that we should be working against according to the five freedoms. But in many species, um, fighting is also very important. It's a normal part of how individuals um, manage their conflicts. Um, in chimpanzees, it's a normal part of chimpanzee societies and how they work and how interpersonal relationships are managed. So we need to be careful to not overlook and unintentionally interfere with cultural traditions that have arisen in captive animal populations. Um, since it might be easy to miss a cultural behavior when you're outside of the group, and we have to be uh, uh, not too quick to judge a behavior as bad because we don't feel good about it because we not, or because we might not understand it. So for example, if we look at another case, um, of, of, of something that goes against the five freedoms, creating um, 
you know, a risk of, of disease or, or pain, when you see cultural practices like feces eating in captive communities, it might in fact be a kind of cultural behavior that's developed in this group that's important to the community, much like some human cultural practices that involve pain and risk of injuries and disease. Things like tattooing our skin or piercing um, our body or even open mouth kissing, which is a horrible thing to do if you want to avoid disease. Um, so these are all sorts of, oh, and then there's one more. So the, the um, emphasis on the five freedoms of normal behavior is also something we need to watch out for because abnormal behaviors might be really culturally important as we see in this case of uh, the orangutans in Camp Leakey who are engaged in very abnormal behavior for chimpanzees, washing clothes, um, paddling boats, sawing logs, but these are behaviors that they've learned from their, their cross-species uh, community at Camp Leakey. So when we return to the typical welfare concerns of the five freedoms, we see that this first one, freedom from hunger and thirst remains, but we should be a little more concerned um, and careful with the other four, uh, especially because it might be difficult for us to identify a behavior as cultural um, so rather than just saying we need to stop this behavior because there's discomfort involved or there is risk of pain, um, we can look instead and see, is this a behavior that might be important to the group? Understanding the animals at the level of their group, at the level of culture, as opposed to just at an individual level. So caring for animal cultures is where I want to leave us on and having empathy for animals as cultural beings and, as, um, and in terms of their groups and their different, uh, different sorts of cultures that the, of the same species in their different groups. Uh, the UNESCO Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity states that cultural diversity is as necessary for humankind as biodiversity is for nature. I don't see any reason to limit this to humankind. Um, these ideas that uh, cultural diversity is necessary for being human is also there for species like the chimpanzees, like the whales, uh, and it might be also there for animals that we're just starting to see how they're cultural, like the, the bumblebees and the fruit flies. So having a culture is part of being a human being, for sure. To imagine a human being without any culture is in a way not to imagine a human. But likewise, having a culture is part of being a member of many species. And by valuing animals' capacity to have culture, we're not approving of all the contents of their culture, rather we're making a deeper claim, namely that cultural beings require culture to be themselves, and that they are something else if they're merely the living biological material devoid of a cultural context. So what I want to leave you with in these pictures here is uh, an image first of Tetsuru Matsuzawa and his lifelong research partner, Chimpanzee Ai, and her son Ayumu. And Tetsuru Matsuzawa was part of this community for, um, well, all of Ayumu's life and for most of Ai's life. Um, they make up a valuable culture that ought not be destroyed, just like in this image I found on Eileen Shershow's photography website of um, this interspecies community of a couple with their, and their pet dogs. So in closing, cultures in both wild can change in such a significant way that they cannot be reintroduced into wild populations. We're at a point in animal captivity that there have been generations of great apes, cetaceans, and other species born into captivity. These are captive natives, and they should be provided with the opportunities to create their own cultures that allow them to thrive and that partially constitute who they are. Thanks for your attention. And thanks to Simon Fitzpatrick, who I worked on part of this project with. That was really fascinating. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, we definitely have time for a few questions. Um, anybody who has any 
uh, questions for Dr. Andrews, please just drop them in the Q&A function here in uh, Zoom. I'll look out for any that come in. Um, I guess one question I have while I'm waiting to see if anyone in the audience has questions. So, I mean, it's fascinating to think about the task of empathizing for animal cultures and for the seemingly for the very reasons that you raised about like the difficulty in construing what counts as a relevant like animal cultural behavior as such. And it made me think about there are all these you hear about these viral stories about in identifiable individual animals like Cecil the lion, Harambe the gorilla, um, pl plenty of other cases. You know, someone passing around a baby dolphin that got beached or something. These hor horrible stories that get um, that go viral, but they don't seem to. They seem different. I mean, they're, they're often contrasted with people's insensitivity to broader issues that these animals might face within a broader cultural setting. And I'm wondering if navigating the challenge of empathizing with animals and thinking about what empathy means in this space. Is it, why do you think people seem to be so eager to empathize with like these individual animals where the reference to culture seems sort of very, very much in the background? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I guess it's a sociological question. Maybe Christoph has the answer to it more so than me, but it does seem that in these stories, the way they're reported and the way um, often, yeah, I see in the media, we see animals being described as individuals outside of any sort of community or culture. So what we didn't see is who was affected by uh, Harumbe's death. Like what, were, what was going on in that community? How were the other animals and how were the human caregivers affected by this? We didn't see interviews with the humans so much, the caregivers, because this was something that, wanted to, that we had to shut down. Uh, I mean, we, the, the media, uh, the zoos and so on. Um, I I really keep talking a lot about um, the kinds of shows like Meerkat Manor and other sorts of like television programs where you're not just popping in and following a single individual like on a nature show and seeing them like do a little thing and then popping out, but that you're following a community over time um, the way you would in a soap opera with human characters because I think that's what's really going to help us understand uh, non-human animal cultures better and we'll raise these questions in our mind when we hear these horrible stories. So we won't just think, oh no, what happened to Harambe or what happened to Cecil was terrible, but oh my gosh, Cecil's community, what happened there? How are those lions surviving the death of, uh, of Cecil? Um, and that's the kind of empathy I want to encourage us to develop. Great, thank you. Um, so we're, we're seeing some more questions start to stream in. Um, I'll try to, so again, for folks who have questions for any of our speakers, just use the Q&A function, then I'll try to recap the, your questions and pitch them to the speakers. So uh, Sean Laurent asks, he says, thank you for the wonderful and thought-provoking talk. He's wondering whether you think that cultures will inevitably, inevitably develop and how quickly, and whether whatever cultures do develop are ultimately healthy. Well, the, the question about whether they're healthy is a, is a, is a, is a good question. I don't, I don't know. Um, but we do see that there's a lot of stability in these, um, say, for example, these chimpanzee cultural traditions that we've observed. Um, chimpanzees and females immigrate when they get to be reproductive age. They'll give up their old tradition and adopt the tradition of the new group, which, which does suggest that the um, traditions aren't changing very rapidly in chimpanzees. Yet then we also see things in chimpanzees like, let's wear uh, a piece of grass in our ear and let's do this for a while. And a while can be several years. I mean, that behavior still exists. Whereas in the capuchin monkeys, who stuck the fingers up each other's noses and rocked back and forth. And so this is kind of a really disgusting, risky behavior because they've got long nails. They're also sticking their eye sockets. And it was very strange. This behavior is something that was a trend. It lasted for a while. And then when, um, the, when the, the monkey who started the trend died, it kind of just disappeared. So I think we'll see some last for a while, some things come and go, um, but some are much more conservative. 
And the next you know, steps, I think, in the study of animal culture will be to try to identify different types of cultural traditions and answer questions about why some of them are such so long lasting and why some of them fluctuate and look more like human fashion trends. So um, potentially related to that broader question. Um, so Dan Kelly, Daniel Kelly has a very interesting talk, Kristen. Nothing particularly deep in this question, he says, but just because you didn't, by name specifically, do you think there's a distinctive role that examples of animal play for thinking about animal play and thinking about animal cultures? Even if there isn't anything specific about play as it relates to culture, do you think there might be a kind of special value it has if one of the aims is trying to get people in the general public to empathize with animals and generate concern about their welfare? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, good question. Thanks for showing up. Uh, animal play, I think, is a is a great place to to also look at kind of cultural behaviors. The capuchin monkey games they they they're called games. These finger and eye games, but uh, um, so they are an example of something that I think when we when I tell this story in detail about the the monkeys, people it does grip them. They are really interested in um, those sorts of playful behaviors. Uh, so I, I agree that that is an important thing to stress in order to get people interested and to see animals as having these communities. Of course, social norms um, and how social norms might differ in different animal communities would be another thing to stress. In 20 minutes, I didn't get a chance to talk about either of those, but I, I would, would like to. Yeah, thanks. So there are a few more questions coming in, but I also want to, I see your hand, Christoph, so I'm curious what, what questions you have. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I also don't want to steal the time of people in the audience to ask questions because it's a really great opportunity for them to engage with this. Um, so I try to keep it quick and um, and thank you for your wonderful talk uh, as well. And I'm very uh, fascinated by this research on culture with animals, right? Uh, but then <clears throat> I can't help but start feeling very uncomfortable when you start talking about culture with captive animals. And this is kind of really when you see these dolphins interacting like we know they, they are not um, treated always very well and we know that they kind of there's a lot of suffering going on in this captive environment so how much do we really want to kind of value that type of captive um, animal cultures um, if we know that their lives are not great um, and how many examples can we actually give for meaningful culture of captive animals um, I'm, I'm pretty sure there are a few, and I can think of farmed animals in, in farm sanctuaries um, or kind of where animals are actually allowed to express their social, cultural behaviors. Uh, but then if, if we kind of put them away in labs or um, actually impose our own needs on them, how much is this really allowing um, them to be free? Um, so I, I feel like that there's, there's a paradox there, talking about the, the freedoms that the animals have, but then uh, looking at captivated animals. Yeah, thanks, Christoph. It's a great question. Um, and I agree with you that, that a lot of the captive situations are really horrific, but I think that they're horrific and yet they're still, they could still be cultural. Right. So I, for example, I wrote a piece in the in the Conversation Canada about against the idea of farming octopuses and uh, this this proposal for an octopus farm because I said this, it's going to create this horrible octopus culture when you if you put so many octopuses together in captivity they're they're going to fight and they're going to damage one another because they're very delicate animals and it's going to be like a horrible slum miserable, like most dystopian culture you can imagine. Um, and I, I, so I think that even talking about culture in these sorts of really horrific situations is also going to be valuable because it's a way of deepening how horrible they are. It's not just that the animals, you know, individuals are feeling pain, but you're creating, you're creating a dystopian society. Um, that's like the short answer to to your to your question. I think some in some of the lab situations, you're not even allowing the animals to create a culture at all. Um, if you've got a bunch of rats living in shoe boxes and you take them out to put them in a maze, they don't have opportunities for social learning from one another. Um, and that's another that's an issue. I think that's a real issue. Yeah. Well, thank you.
That does seem to connect to and potentially answer. There's a question by Nella um, just about this, the paradox of caring for cultural practices while at the same time keeping them captive and de denying bodily autonomy, especially um, even if culture is relevant for spaces like sanctuaries where their well-being is a priority, uh, other spaces like research centers and labs where they might be used and exploited in some way. So it seems like you're touching on some of what Nella's question was. Yeah, I mean, ideally, we wouldn't have animals being exploited when they're when they're participating in research. Um, this is an ideal. This is the ideal. Uh, but I know that that is not met. So looking at a few of the questions, um, there are a number of really fascinating ones. Many of them have to do with like how we're thinking about the meaning of culture. And I can try to condense a few of them. Uh, Maria Teresa Alvarez Mateos writes about the concept of culture. Um, if we understand by culture the socially learned patterns of behavior as well as the processes of transmission and learning these patterns, we can speak about cultural animals in the same sense as by humans. Um, but what about other definitions of culture, such as those related to the process of invention, creativity, such as artistic creativity, or uh, related to the sedimentation of institutions along history? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, good. Right. So the in the issue of institutions, I think we, while, while you'll have some folks describing some things that animals are doing in terms of politics and politicking, especially when it comes to dominance hierarchies and, and so on, uh, none of this relates to the creation of institutions. Um, so that, that sort of um, aspect of culture, at least we don't, I don't think anyone would say we have evidence of that right now. Um, and other species. But when it comes to creativity, um, the culture rests on innovation, right? So an innovative behavior, somebody was going to create the first kind of um, example of cracking a nut. Someone figured that out. Uh, some chimpanzee figured that out. Some chimpanzee added an anvil um, because it was better to, and it turned out that it was better to crack a nut on an anvil than it was on the ground. Um, some other chimpanzee, you know, I'm, I, I'm simplifying the story, but some other chimpanzee put a wedge under the anvil um, in order to hold it steady. And because we see these kind of cultural and I think even cumulative cultural developments in some non-human animal species, um, we there is evidence of creativity. There's gotta be evidence of creativity because these were things that were, were yeah, in, innovative to begin with. Maybe not artistic, um, but it's for some species, people will describe what they're doing as artistic, like bower bird bowers. Um, uh, some folks are totally happy talking about that as artistic um, and work on as the aesthetic sense in non-human animals, I think is there's a little bit of research on this and it's a, it's a fascinating area that I only know very superficially, but it might be there too. Great. Um, so we'll handle a few more questions before flipping it over to Christoph's talk. Um, but there's, so let's see. So Paula Drogue asks about different kinds of social learning. Um, so she says that bee learning seems different than chimpanzee learning. Group impacts would be important to bees as they are obviously social, but it seems like the sorts of impacts would be different. So I guess distinctions among kinds of learning within these different cultures. For sure, yeah. I mean, there are lots of different types of social learning, of course. And so I think it's useful and some people do draw distinctions between different types of culture based on what are the mechanisms that are used for acquiring the new behaviors. Um, so is there imitation involved or is it, uh, is it um, you know, is something else going on? Um, we, I think that's, that's totally fair. And these distinctions might actually be useful if, once, if we wanna create a fine grained topology of cultural subtypes. Um, Again, I think next steps. The bees, bees and eusocial insects are super interesting because there seems to be less flexibility in these uh, communities. And so what gets learned might be much more limited than what could be learned in, um, in species that have more uh, freedoms in their social structures. Yeah, thanks for the question. So there are, there are a couple more that are specifically about this question of culture. And there's a couple more about like impacts of culture on treatment. So I'll try to unify these two themes. Um, Arita Gupta asks about animals that have been domesticated for thousands of years. How, it's like dogs and cats that are kept as pets, how would they build their cultures independent of humans? Is that something that's possible? Um, well, I think so, because they, we do have um, street dog communities as well that are being studied in um, 
uh, some of them, I think, I don't, I don't know the, I don't know this research very well, but I know in India and in, I think it's Morocco, um, there are research groups studying um, the behavior of, of, of dogs that are living outside of human care, or at least the kind of human care that is familiar in kind of a, a, a middle-class Western <laughs> communities like my household. I have a dog who lives in my house. I put on a leash and walk down the city street. Um, but there are lots of different models of humans um, as individuals who they are neighbors with but are not being directly cared for. So yeah, those sorts of changes I think are possible even though we have the, this co-evolution with humans and dogs. It's, an, it's a fascinating topic. So one more uh, question on that general theme and then just a couple more and then we'll, we'll, we'll flip things over. Um, so one of the anonymous attendees asks about just the broader question about viewing cultures and traditions through a human lens that in the risk of potential for some kinds of bias, how do, what parameters are in place for scientists to remain objective as they're trying to understand whether, how, whether and how to interpret animal cultures? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a big kind of philosophy of science question. Um, and I think that uh, what I would say is that trying to remain objective is maybe something to aim for, but scientists are never able to achieve it because we're all always doing science from a perspective. So because we're humans and we have perspectives and when we're, when we're practicing science, we're doing it from our perspective. Um, but what would be one way of trying to avoid making the outcomes of our science or the perception of culture in a community just being um, something that comes from the perspective of one individual is to have the work done in different labs with different scientists coming from different backgrounds with different training. Um, you know, so cross-disciplinary research, I think, is really important and tries to help uh, get at the sorts of biases that might be built into uh, how scientists are trained in psychology versus in anthropology, how philosophers are trained. Um, but I also think it's really useful to also come at these questions from a cross-cultural perspective. So the scientists themselves are in different cultures. So you might have noticed at the beginning of the talk when I said that culture was first introduced by scientists, Western scientists in 1999, it was introduced by Japanese scientists decades before that. Um, because the Japanese who were studying the, um, the monkeys of Koshima Island saw that this behavior of potato washing was spread. And um, Imanishi, who was the lead the scientist in this group, had already been talking about animal culture and seeing animals as cultural beings, which Franz de Waal suggests comes from his cultural background um, as, as someone growing up without a kind of a, a Christian theistic mindset. This is this was DeWall's theory to explain this. Um, but I do think that it would be extremely useful and helpful for the science to diversify in their cultural backgrounds, instead of just having Europeans and North Americans going in and studying uh, chimpanzees in Africa, we need to have, and, or Japanese coming over and studying chimpanzees in Africa. Um, I think that funding African scientists and training African scientists to study chimpanzees is something that's happening and, um, and I want to support that as well. Yeah. Great. So a couple more questions. Um, some fascinating ones have rolled in. Um, so you've talked about pr preserving culture and my colleague in the rock, Ben Jones, has a question about there's this presumption for preserving culture. In a human context, though, one can think of examples where that presumption should might be overridden. So, for example, a frat with a culture of sexual harassment and violence. Do you think we can make similar moral judgments for animals and what principles might help us navigate that space? Yeah, I think this is so when, when it comes to this is a very tricky issue. Um, some philosophers have, have been engaging with this, whether we should intervene um, on in wild animal populations. Um, it's not something I work on and it's, but it's my just general opinion that we probably should not intervene in wild animal populations where we have real responsibilities would be in the cultures that are, uh, that involve humans and the cultures of captivity. 
where I think we have a real responsibility to try to shape the culture so that they are not harmful um, to the members of the, the community to the best we can. So if you've got something like say feces eating, feces eating is often tolerated in captive communities because it does seem to be important to, uh, to the animals. There is a risk of, um, of parasites and so on, but there's a way of managing that. Um, so you can allow the animals the freedom to eat feces and give them the sorts of drugs or, or um, monitor them for the kinds of harms that might occur. So I would encourage those sorts of things. Of course, if you've got a situation where in a captivity where there's like animals are killing one another or going to war, this is a cultural behavior, war is a cultural behavior too. I think that that's when the, the human caregivers are gonna have to stop, step in and say, no, we're gonna sacrifice the, this cultural behavior Cap and it was really hard because there was a lot of forced copulation in this community and there was very little that the researchers were willing to do to stop it other than like separating sometimes separating the male from the females um, and not letting them interact at all uh, it was it was it was rough it was a rough thing to witness yeah yeah so two more questions. Um, one is an integration of a question from my colleague in psychology, Karen Gasper, and then also a philosopher, Jason DeCruz, uh, one of the Expanding Empathy alums from last year. Um, so Karen asks, so going back to Sean Laurent's earlier question way at the beginning, how do caretakers approach the ethical issue of when is it suitable or appropriate? What, what is or is suitable, appropriate, meaningful culture? How does one think about what are suitable things to provide or not provide animals? And then Jason also, Jason Cruz is asking what kinds of cultural norms might impede or improve animal flourishing, especially in spaces where we think about things like food production and industry. Yeah, I mean, this is where I guess I would want to really defer to the experts in animal welfare, um, especially individuals who know the species that we're talking about. Um, getting So everything that Simon and I say in our paper where we're, we argue for uh, welfare consideration being expanded, we then say, and we're not the experts here <laughs> um, when it comes to the behavior of say ch chickens or, uh, or pigs or cows that are being kept in um, situations where they're being produced for food. Um, when my area of expertise is mostly in primates. So the kind of social learning opportunities that I think would be useful for, for primates to, to supply them would be things like, like multiple instances of materials that could be innovated with, um, like the rice bag example I gave during the talk, like give lots of rice bags, um, let individuals all be able to use them at the same time, as opposed to having like one box that's a kind of a food puzzle box in, a, in an enclosure that an animal can work on one at a time. And most you get another animal observing um, and then taking turns and then, manipulating the box, you've got that kind of social learning, um, but you don't have the opportunity for trends to spread. The, the question of how you identify something as a cultural behavior that's important to the animal, I think is also a really good question and one I'd want to defer to the experts on of those animals in, in, to answer that. Yeah, so it, these are great questions. I, I wish I had better answers for you. And the, the last one is is really, it might be an interesting segue to the, the psychological aspects of the, of the panel. So Jack Odiwarn asks about, you know, we know from human cultures, various discriminations and biases that exist for things pe humans can't control, things like rape, the targets of discrimination can't control, things like height, race, weight. He's wondering if this kind of social discrimination can be seen in certain animal cultures, or if there's some variation of that that's been seen. Um... It's a good question. Um, there was a recent report of a chimpanzee with albinism that was that was treated differently from chimpanzees without albinism. I don't remember the details. Um, that's the only thing that comes to mind at this moment. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Great. Well, thank you for fielding all these questions. And if if, if anybody else has questions that from this first presentation, please just feel free to drop them in. I'll make a point of coming back to them in the discussion afterwards. But now I want to turn it over to Dr. Christoph Dant, who will be 
talking about uh, the psychology of of human animal interactions. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much. Um, I will uh, start sharing on my screen as well and see how that works. So yeah, thank you very much, Dara, for inviting me on this uh, on this panel and for organizing this wonderful uh, series of speakers. I'm really thrilled and thank uh, thank you everyone for showing up. <clears throat> I'm also, uh, yeah, still have so many questions for the previous speaker as well for Kristen, because um, it's it's a complicated topic for sure. Um, uh, but let's focus on my talk first now. <laughs> um, so yeah, for my background from uh, social psychology, moral psychology, personality psychology, um, we've been looking at um, and group relations for decades now and historically focused on attitudes and attitude change towards um, and how groups interact from, uh, but mostly focused on human intergroup interactions, right? Um, and only recently we start to um, incorporate the study of human animal relations in this um, in the scope and this area of research. And what we discover is that we actually can learn quite a lot uh, from human animal interactions for um, our understanding for human intergroup relations, but also the other way around there. A lot of the theorizing and the research we've done um, in social psychology on intergroup relations uh, can be applied or at least uh, extended to the, uh, the research of uh, human animal relations. And, um, and I hope uh, with this talk to kind of convince you of that point in the first place, but also uh, to give you some kind of overview of the complications that we have and that we face with human animal interactions here um, and, and give you an overview of the work we've been doing on that. Um, so one of these um, uh, key findings, key observations when uh, people start focusing on human animal interaction is that paradox that we see um, that on the one hand, we care deeply about animals. And normally I would ask the audience here, and maybe I can ask Daryl now, like, do you identify as a dog person or as a cat person? It's complicated because I have a dog-like cat. I have a Siberian forest cat. Um, so so you, you would say and, both then? Both and. Both cat and dog person. Okay, and, and Kristen, do you identify as a dog or a, or a cat person? Uh, no, I was, I, I've had both animals and now I don't know what I am. Okay, so there's like an identity crisis going on. Well, and uh, typically we would see like 30, 40% of the audience really waving their hands. Yeah, I'm a cat person. And then the other 30, 40% say, I'm a dog person. And then a couple of people saying both. And, and a minority is um, not really identifying as a, as a dog or a cat person. But it it's something meaningful because I didn't even define what that means and people still kind of understand what it means so it's not something really well defined in any psychological literature and in scientific literature but people do identify with this type of kind of identities um, and it shows that we deeply care about animals and that we can actually feel solidarity for animals and empathize with animals we have animal welfare laws uh, when uh, Kristen was talking about these cultures in animals I'm sure most of us was were like fascinated yeah these fish can do this and um, nature documentaries are also very popular so um, so we 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 really don't want to see animals being harmed and it's emotionally disturbing it can cause massive public outrage if kind of these um, instances happen and, and it's and it's on the TV when a person kicks a dog or an animal in a zoo is being killed because it's considered surplus. Like you see public outrage about these things. So we deeply care about animals. Um, and <clears throat> companion animals are also considered family members. We easily see their own unique personalities and their social behaviors, how they evolve and basically how they also fit within the family systems. Yeah, at the same time, um, animal exploitation is deeply ingrained in our societal practices and in our cultural traditions. So on a mass scale and on a daily basis, millions of animals are being shot, so it's gassed, suffocated, um, their um, tails are being amputated, and so on. Other um, uh, body parts are being uh, mutilated to, to fit within the production system. Um, and this often happens after uh, living a miserable life in the first place anyway. So we use animals for tons of different reasons, whether it's um, for entertainment like bullfighting or um, uh, fox hunting, as you can see on the slides. 
um, for medical tests or cosmetic tests. And then the biggest contributor of animal suffering is probably the food industry, um, where we, we use animals for um, to feed ourselves, but also the dairy and egg industry involves lots of um, animal suffering and the killing of animals. So we see this paradox in there. And um, it's it's quite interesting and fascinating if that's the if that's the right word to use in this context. Um, from a psychological perspective, to trying to understand what makes people do what they do towards animals. And our moral concern for animals is, is that complicated topic, and empathy for animals, as the topic is from this session, is like, why do we care for some animals, but not for some others? And why do we even care for some, uh, for, claim to care for some of these animals while also using them for our own goods, right? Um, and we see that more concern for animals um, and acceptance of animal exploitation um, varies um, in ways that is actually um, can be seen as, as, as a function of a social relation with these animals um, or how they are actually uh, giving us as humans um, some benefits. And in one of our studies that we run there, we really want to get to the bottom of some of that is we, we it was a very simple question we asked participants and it's we presented them with a, a range of animals 20 animals and we just asked them please select those animals that you feel morally morally obligated to show concern for and what came out of that uh, of those findings is um we factor analyzed this uh, to see which animals would cluster together and um in terms of similar a uh, proportion of the sample uh, would uh, would indicate um, the same animals there, which ones uh, would be going there. And it clustered nicely in four, um, four different animal types. Of course, this is all bottom-up driven, so the categories are shaped and formed by the type of animals we put in there. So we could have had more categories if we included other animals as well. Uh, but based on this 20 animals that we had, we, we found in that factor analysis uh, four different categories um, clustering together. One was the companion animals, which included the dogs, the cats, and the horses. This was an American sample. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that this would be the same results in, in other cultures, um, but we replicated in other Western contexts. Um, and then we had a category of appealing wild animals uh, that included the chimps, the bears, um, and so on, the, the dolphins was in there as well, and the kangaroo. Um, we also had a category of un unappealing wild animals, and these labels were like created by us as well. So if you can find a, a better label for some of these categories, that's, that's fine. Um, the unappealing wild animals were the uh, frogs, sorry, that was uh, too quickly, the frogs and the snakes, uh, starfish, um, and so on. And then in a final category was uh, the food animals, including all the poultry that we had in, in the list, as well as the uh, mammals uh, that are typically farmed uh, for food production, uh, including cows, chicken, turkey, sheep, um, ducks, uh, goats, pigs, I think I have most of them now. So, and then we were interested to look at the mean level ratings of all concern there, or in, in this case, the percentage of the sample that would indicate that they feel morally obligated to show concern for. Um, and these are the, the results, um, but I haven't labeled them yet. So normally I ask the audience, like, what do you think uh, are the results? And people are pretty good at predicting them, but I'll let you um, think for, for a bit now. I'm also happy to set up a poll or something in Zoom if you'd like. Well, maybe that takes too long then to do. <laughs> so uh, yeah, actually, I I should have been aware from COVID times that there's the, these these uh, functions on Zoom that we can actually make it more interactive. Well, folks, um, feel free to chime in in the chat too if you want to engage that way. Yeah, people can uh, put it in the chat, but I'm not sure if I can see if it's good to see the chat. So the yellow bar, uh, most people can easily uh, uh, find out what the yellow bar is there. And that's um, um, the, the companion animals, right? Um, the purple bar then are the, the appealing wild animals, the ones that are being respected, the, often the ones that are also used as flagships for conservation programs. 
Then the blue bar and the red bar are sometimes mixed up. Some people think um, unappealing wild animals are deserving more and more concern than the, uh, or guessing the results, at least from other participants, and food animals uh, and some others think the other way around. So, but it's um, what I think is mostly interesting here is that indeed with the food animals, it drops to about 50% of the sample indicating that uh, pigs or cows uh, deserve more consideration. Um, while uh, biologically speaking, we see that these um, have the uh, same or sometimes more advanced cognitive capacities than some of these appealing wild animals and pigs are seen as often smarter than dogs, although it's always a bit hard to compare different species on, on this front. But they are clearly intelligent beings and they empathize, they have these rich cultural and social lives, right? So what is it about the food animals? that put them on a way lower uh, standards in terms of more considerations. So, and this is um, where psychology kicks in really. This is about driven by personal needs, right? Um, you could ask, uh, when is it acceptable to harm an animal? When is it acceptable to eat an animal? And this is one of the other questions um, that, we, that we asked participants in, a, in another series of studies. But before we go to that, the fact that it's about food um, is also represented in some of the work I've been doing recently with Maria Ian Lenidu, uh, where we compare different more concern scores uh, between dietary groups, for instance. And we see a replication this time on a seven point scale, um, where a replication among the omnivores that there's a clear hierarchy between different types of animals. Um, there's some hierarchy still. Uh, that you can still observe when we look at vegetarians, which is uh, the purple bars, they're still going from lower to higher. And then among vegans, um, um, it's almost consistently super high. Only the unappealing wild animals score a little bit lower, but this is quite a small effect size and clearly also different from how omnivores uh, perceive both food animals and unappealing wild animals. So. Um, this this big sample of vegans clearly appreciate uh, uh, the moral um, value of a wide range of different animals. So there's something about um, what we do and cultural practices around uh, food consumption as well um, that has implications of moral value of, uh, of animals. And uh, where we run this type of studies with Stefan Leach as the first author here, um, on um, what if we present people a number of different characteristics and these uh, uh, and attribute them to animals and let them then decide whether it's wrong or whether they should more feel morally guilty uh, to eat or harm this type of animal. Um, and we, we looked in the animal behavior and the animal cognition literature, what is actually realistic. And we found uh, lots of fascinating aspect that animals can do. So we, we actually worked with characteristics that a number of different animals actually have um, and, and then put it in an experimental test um, where we present these animals, fictitious animals, but also other animals uh, like food animals and told participants these animals either lack this characteristic or has this characteristic and then ask them whether this is more irrelevant basically, whether it's wrong to eat or harm this animal, or whether they feel morally guilty if the uh, animal would be harmed from uh, not at all to very much, right? And then uh, systematically you see when animals have certain characteristics, both in terms of uh, cognitive abilities, intelligence, um, such as spatial reasoning, uh, planning, uh, tool use, um, uh, it's morally relevant. So people feel that they should not be harmed then, um, or harmed less at least. Uh, but the biggest uh, difference we found where we looked at uh, social morality and patience, where if animals express an empathy towards each other or some moral behaviors towards each other, um, then uh, people uh, have the opinion that these animals are definitely deserving more consideration more than when they would not have these characteristics, right? Um, so there seems to be a way to um, to improve people's moral consideration of animals in this sense. And it's, it seems like this is very valuable information if we want to change people's attitudes towards animals, uh, if they all of a sudden um, think animals should not be harmed. I see uh, 
when they don't have those characteristics, uh, it's just above the midpoint of the scale, which is quite similar to where the food animals were in terms of more consideration. So this, this, it's nice to compare that, but once they have a certain characteristics and you kind of tell participants that, it, it really goes up to, um, to the scale point where it's um, a lot or very much more consideration um, in terms of, or really wrong to, to eat or harm this type of animals. Now, one of these things could lead to the conclusion, well, let, let's inform people then about these characteristics, this will help. Um, but that's where another psychological trick comes in. And we know since um, a decade, about a decade now about the meat paradox. And I think um, uh, one of the previous speakers in the series here, uh, Brock Bastian also uh, talked about the meat paradox where people uh, implement all kinds of quantitative strategies to avoid being exposed to information about intelligence sentence, to um, engage with denial strategies, uh, uh, denying the mind of animals, to make sure they don't feel morally obligated to, to show concern for animals and to feel better with their own behaviors. So in a new series of studies, we, we actually exposed people or give the participants the opportunity to be exposed to information about animal intelligence and sentience. Um, and we systematically observe that there's a motivated avoidance of information going on about food animal minds. Um, for instance, in, in one study, we, we just asked participants uh, whether they uh, would like to find out about, or learn about the minds of food animals. And, and uh, on average, it was like an average, a um, decent level of interest there that people uh, Indicator, but this was correlated significantly with people's commitment to eating meat. And meat commitment can be measured also with a very simple scale: how much, uh, how much you desire to have meat in ed every meal. Where you can actually Im imagine yourself replacing meat in in, in a meal, and so on. Um, and this is correlated 0.26 with uh, motivation to uh, avoid information about food animal sentience. Right. So this is um, that was. This is the graph you see in other studies. We actually uh, let participants give them the opportunity to engage with information that popped up on a, on a screen and, and time their reaction, whether they would click it away or not. And, and we see again that meat commitment was associated with faster reaction time. So people higher on meat commitment were faster to click information away on a pop-up screen uh, uh, and they were told that they were involved in an unrelated experiment on a pop-up screen where that's about, that information was about, um, would learn them, would give them some information, educate them about the minds of food animals. And there was no correlation when we did that with uh, companion animals. When the, when the information was about dogs, we couldn't see any correlation with commitment uh, to eating meat. So it's clear that kind of our uh, behaviors and our um, Practices of meat consumption uh, is related to um, to um, how open we are to engage with information about food animal minds, right? And it's it's uh, it determines the more more consideration of animals and pro has profound implications for society uh, and whether we want to um, establish more animal rights and where we really care about the welfare and interests of animals and probably also about whether we're interested in the culture of animals then. Now, zooming out a bit about this personal motives behind it, more on the work I've been doing for a couple of years now, it's a kind of this intergroup perspectives of human animal relations, where we look at um, uh, our behavior towards animals in similar way as our behaviors from one group towards another human group and see um, our behaviors and attitudes towards animals as a form of, of prejudice. And where we can actually draw parallels there between uh, exploitation of animals and the consumption of animals um, and the exploitative practices in the past towards other human outgroups and, and uh, the struggle to end animal exploitation uh, whether there are any parallels with the struggle uh, to uh, that have been uh, fought by the human rights movement and so on. And this is a, an, a question that a number of philosophers and scholars have been asking and be posing um, and arguing for for a while. Um, and that's where the concept of speciesism com comes in. It's uh, 
It's uh, one of these constructs that has been popularized by uh, Peter Singer in his famous book, Animal Liberation. And it's defined by the discrimination against or exploitation of animal species by human beings based on the assumption of human superiority. And so human supremacy believes it's one aspect of that, um, one expression of that species uh, attitude or prejudice. Um, and the other one is that we also discriminate between different types of species. And that was clearly well indicated in the moral considerations clause where companion animals are put on a much higher standard than, for instance, farmed animals. So we have this kind of um, what others have called also pet speciesism, companion animal speciesism. Um, and there's been a lot more psychological research on this topic now. We can actually measure speciesism with a, with a, a scale. Um, and often we can also measure it with items asking about the, uh, the moral acceptance of using animals for different types of practices and number of items, right? Um, and it's a deeply psychological question. So if we can measure speciesism, and we know we can measure uh, uh, racist prejudice or sexist prejudice, we can look at how these patterns uh, of scores correlate with each other. And if there's some parallels to be drawn there, we would expect just like um, the correlations that we typically observe between uh, sexism and racism, uh, we should also expect positive correlations to emerge for speciesism. And the historically speaking from social psychology, there's this, this idea that there's a some kind of common ideological core underlying different types of prejudices there um, rooted in uh, belief systems that are partly also sustained by society, but also um, at the psychological level, we see that um, individual differences there that can score higher on this ideological factors um, that drive different types of prejudices there. This is uh, from the work of Adorno in the, in the 50s with the authoritarian personality, um, or with uh, the work of uh, Alport, Gordon Alport, also in the 50s, on the prejudice personality. Both scholars and their team of researchers assume that there's a common psychological core there, or ideological core, or personality structure underpinning different types of speciesism, uh, prejudice in those species. Uh, <clears throat> and work on, and I'm not going to have time to go into detail here, but we see also in ecofeminism these ideas that speciesism is uh, deeply uh, interconnected with sexism and meat consumption with the work of uh, Carol Adams, but also other uh, feminists have written about that, uh, such as McKinnon and Laurie, uh, Laurie Green. Um, um, so it's, it's, it's worth highlighting the work of, of these uh, scholars as well, that there's actually tons of uh, information out there that, hasn't, that have not been tested empirically by psychologists uh, with our own methods, even though it's very well documented um, in some of these books and, and articles these scholars have written. Um, giving you some very basic uh, idea there is that when we talk about the psychology of speciesism as a form of prejudice, uh, we, we would expect these uh, constructs to be related to each other, and there is a common ideological core there that connects these different types of prejudices. And this is one of the ideas we tested um, in, in, in a, a program of research that we conducted. Uh, we sp were specifically interested and, and theorized that one of the, the core factors there should be um, the desires to dominate, the preference for inequality, um, and the preference for group dominance in society. And this is known uh, in social psychology as social dominance orientation. Um, uh, based on social dominance theory um, by Felicia Prato and Jim Sidanius in the 90s, um, where, where they use social dominance orientation as, um, as the psychological factor. Uh, they called it a personality factor when they first published on this topic, but this has moved on and um, a number of scholars would rather consider it as an ideological uh, preference there. Um, and, and it's been shown that this is a, a, a very robust predictor of prejudice across different domains and contexts. So, um, and there was a, some research out there already that showed that high scores on social dominance orientations are the people scoring higher on uh, social dominance orientation also show a greater preference for hierarchy and human animal relations. Um, see much bigger differences between human and non-human animals 
uh, as conceptualized in the human animal divide, um, or, and also show strong human supremacy beliefs that the belief that humans are at the top and dominate all other species. Um, so it's clear that this concept of social dominance was clearly uh, a very good um, candidate to represent the common ideological core that connects uh, uh, speciesism with these different types of prejudices. And, and that's what we, we also tested in a number of different samples. And here we uh, I show you the, min, uh, the, the results of the mini meta-analysis that we conducted across different samples, um, where we first observed the expected positive correlation between speciesism and ethnic prejudice, point 24. Um, but once we uh, modeled social dominance orientation there, we first of all observed very strong <coughs> positive correlations between social dominance orientation and both ethnic prejudice and speciesism, um, completely in line with the model, the theoretical model that we, we uh, formulated, the social dominance human animal relation model, uh, but also that the, as expected, the residual correlation between ethnic prejudice and speciesism was completely wiped out after controlling for social dominance orientation, which gave us an indication in support of the theory that indeed social dominance orientation is the explaining factor there that connects different types of prejudices. And we saw that in other in some of our other research that we've done, um, that I've done with my PhD students, uh, Alina Salman at that time, that this is also happening when we, when we measure uh, sexism, and that people like, um, and research teams um, led by Lucy Scariola show that um, similar patterns emerge where we, where we look at homophobia, for instance, positive correlations with speciesism, and this correlation disappears or significantly reduces when you take into account social dominance orientation, right? Um, and this model, um, was still there after controlling for a number of other ideological factors. And one of these key other factors is right-wing authoritarianism, um, which came um, from the authoritarian personality from Adorno, but then popularized by or revamped by Altamire in the 80s. Uh, the co-variation of authoritarian submission, uh, traditional and conventional values, and uh, author support for authoritarian ag aggression towards norm violators. Right? But the, nowadays you would see it as an ideological preference for uh, social conservatism and traditionalism and really sticking to traditions and uh, conventionalism. And we never really found strong uh, associations between right-wing authoritarian and speciesism, um, especially not when, we, when social dominance orientation is already uh, taken into account. Right? So it's, uh, it's a really good indication that social dominance orientation is, is really driving that connection between ethnic prejudice and speciesism. And, and speciesism defined as the general kind of uh, orientation towards animals, that animals can be used for human benefits and with uh, humans at, um, as being superior, seen as being uh, superior to other animals. Um, but then we, we wanted to take it a step further. Like we, we, we didn't think that right-wing authoritarianism or that kind of need or desire for social conformity and traditions would be uh, completely uh, irrelevant in our support for practice of animal exploitations. Uh, instead, we think, well, right-wing authoritarianism would become way more relevant when we look at local cultural practices that are seen as part of the tradition are part of the cultural practices in specific countries or local cultures, right? Because we did observe that social conformity and desires for traditions and right-wing authoritarianism as, the, as a good indicator for that is correlated with more meat consumption, with seeing vegetarianism and veganism as a cultural threat to the dominant meat culture, um, and especially when it ties into family traditions. So uh, that's where we reason that um, right-wing authoritarians would be related to uh, greater support for specific practices of animal exploitation that are um, tied to the own culture, but not necessarily when it's tied to uh, uh, foreign cultures, um, where we just expect that social dominance orientation would still be the key predictor there. So, and then the last set of studies um, that I will present here 
is that we wanted to tease out this differential influence of social dominance orientation and right-wing authoritarianism in predicting support for different types of animal exploitation practices. And that's where we conducted uh, survey work um, in different countries, in Spain, in Norway, and in Australia. And we focused on three local practices, whaling, bullfighting, and kangaroo hunting. And the idea was that people, first of all, just uh, very much into group dynamics and uh, the, the cultural preferences of the own culture over the other cultures, that people would show generally, on average, show stronger support for practice of animal exploitation of their own cultures, or own con country, I should say. And that then as a second hypothesis, social dominance orientation would be uh, associated with greater support for um, all kinds of uh, cultural practices uh, involving animal exploitation. So there's a, just a general dominance desire there that people can do whatever they want with animals um, for, for human benefits. So there's no, nothing specific there about social dominance. We will predict uh, support for animal exploitation across practices across different uh, cultures. And uh, the unique prediction here was that right-wing authoritarianism would be associated with greater support for one's own country's practices, but not necessarily for support for uh, someone else's uh, practices. Is that, uh, hopefully that's clear enough. Um, so um, um, I will not go into the details of the methods here because there's simply no time, but um, just to give you a flavor, a sense of how we uh, measured support for whaling, bullfighting, and kangaroo hunting. We used the same measures in all three countries and asked about to what extent we generally support or oppose bullfighting, for instance. And on other items were more about moral acceptance of these practices. And we gave all the participants um, the same items across all these different practices, of course, translated into their uh, in Norwegian, Spanish, and then uh, Australia was just um, English. And that's where we can start the guessing game again, um, where, um, where, where the results, the mean level results were very straightforward and completely as predicted here. So you see um, in, um, in this bars, the results for one specific practice uh, where we had Norway, Spain, and Australia. And there's clearly more, more uh, acceptance of the practice in Norway. So uh, anyone would know what practice this would be? Whaling. Um, I can't see the chat, so I can't follow up of anyone who's uh, engaging in this. So we see this um, clearly almost no support for sp uh, Spanish participants and Australian participants for whaling, while clearly is a decent level of uh, acceptability and support for this practice for animal exploitation in Norway. Then the second practice we looked at was uh, giving us this result, where Spanish participants all of a sudden show a stronger level of support. Not massive support, because we know that this practice is not as popular anymore as in the past, uh, but still it's significantly different from participants in other cultures. And this was indeed the support for bullfighting. Um, while the last one then, uh, support for kangaroo hunting, and that was an interesting pattern we observed. So there was clearly more, su most support from Australian participants as compared to Spanish and Norwegian participants. But also in, um, in, uh, in Norway, people were still uh, more supportive towards uh, kangaroo hunting uh, compared to Spanish uh, participants. And as far as I know, there are no kangaroos in Norway in the wild. So I don't think they're hunting kangaroos there, but I think it might be, has to do, might has to do with the, with the fact that there's quite a bit of hunting going on in Norway anyway. So they uh, do wildlife hunting there. It's part of the tradition. So they might be more open to kangaroo hunting in, in Australia then as well, and find that more acceptable, right? So, but overall the results clearly confirm the set of hypotheses that people um, are more acceptable, um, find it more acceptable um, to engage in these practices of animal exploitation when it's tied to the own culture compared to other cultures to the practice of other cultures. So now we want to look at the ideological predictors here. And um, 
whether social dominance orientation and right-wing authoritarianism would predict support for greater support for these three practices in each of these countries. And you see an overview of what we expected here. And then I show you the preliminary results of regression analysis that we did um, within each of these samples. So to, to recap, we predicted social dominance would predict uh, support, greater support for any type of animal exploitation practice across countries. While right-wing authoritarianism was a very specific prediction every time, it should be only uh, popping up as a predictor of the practice when the practice is, is culturally relevant within that country. And if you look at the results um, there for uh, the Norwegian sample, we found uh, support there for, for both hypotheses, where social dominance indeed predicted uh, so greater support for all three practices. Um, but right-wing authoritarianism only predicted support for uh, whaling in Norway, right? Um, then in Spain, the results looked like this, where we see social dominance orientation clearly predicting great support for whaling uh, among Spanish participants, as well as great support for kangaroo hunting among Spanish participants, but did not predict great support for bullfighting once it's already taking into account uh, right-wing authoritarianism. So there was a, a significant correlation there between SDO and bullfight, support for bullfighting, um, but that was completely kind of uh, wiped out once uh, we take right-wing authoritarianism into account, which to me, and that um, standardized standardized coefficient is, is quite strong here with right-wing authoritarianism really uh, being a very pronounced predictor in Spain of support for bullfighting, um, which to me is, uh, is an indication that this is a very strong cultural tradition, a very strongly tied to the cultural identity and national identity of, of Spanish people there, um, in terms of especially the ones high on uh, uh, social conventionalism and traditionalism. And then finally, um, the results for Australia supported the social dominance orientation hypothesis, but we couldn't find any uh, significant uh, effect of right-wing authoritarianism. So um, this was the only one that really uh, did not confirm our expectations. And to some extent that might actually be uh, meaningful in the sense that kangaroo hunting is not really seen um, and only kind of find that out after talking to, uh, Australians on, on this topic or when Australians were in the audience, and there might be uh, some uh, Australians in the audience today as well, that they would not consider this as a tradition for Australia. It's it's seen as pest control. So it's not tied to cultural identities. There are to uh, con social conventionalism. So we, we would not necessarily expect right wing authoritarianism there to be a, a big predictor there, uh, while social dominance orientation uh, was, as expected, consistently predicting uh, support for the three practices of animal exploitation. Um, so this is a summary of these results, um, which I already kind of recapped in the previous slide. Um, so I, I, I'm not going to spend too much time on this one uh, to leave more time for questions. And that uh, does lead me to, um, to more concluding slides like, uh, in this session on empathy for animals, we look at loving animals, and there can be more concern for an empathic concern for animals, um, and at the same time, paradoxically exploiting animals. And that seems to be tied to, uh, first of all, personal motives and desires, um, social and cultural norms, and we see clear differences there between cultures, but also uh, when, when it becomes traditions, uh, people care a lot more about family and, and family tradition and cultural traditions, society traditions there. Um, and we identify a number of ideological motives there uh, that also drive. And, and of course, these three psychological or cultural factors, um, uh, they are all intertwined, right? So one cannot exist without the others and this, they intersect deeply together. Um, and some can be measured at, an, at the ideological, at the psychological individual level and some are more happening at group levels. Um, and then one of the topics that I didn't talk about is the gender-based ideology and prejudice that also comes into play when it comes to meat consumption and caring about animals um, that we, we've seen in other work that we've been doing that, um, that it's uh, 
very much gender based as well. There's a gender dynamic going on that that comes into the mix, make it even more complicated to make, uh, especially men care more about animals or reduce their meat consumption. Um, it, it proves to be very challenging when the norm, the masculine traditional norm is to eat as much meat as you can because you need to be strong and powerful. Um, on a more general note, I would say, we need to move towards a, a, a social psychology of human animal relation that is now emerging. Uh, we definitely need to read into other subdisciplines who have been looking into these topics for several decades. So we're behind, like I said in the beginning, we're behind with psychology to look into that. And, um, but that will also make us stronger as a discipline to inform other disciplines and, uh, and subdisciplines here. Um, so there's tons of different uh, opportunities there to do more research on this topic and how to increase empathy to animals. Uh, one uh, possibility might be looking at interspecies contact, whether um, if we care more about, want to care about more about animals, maybe we should actually interact with animals uh, on a more meaningful level rather than putting them away um, behind uh, closed bars, especially when it comes to uh, farmed animals. It will still be challenging to come into interspecies contact uh, when it's about um, dangerous and uh, poisonous animals. So that's probably not a very good recommendation there. But given that the most animal suffering is happening in, in astrofactory farming, uh, we, we, we could start there to explore the opportunities to empathize with animals by visiting uh, farm sanctuaries and so on and really recognize this personality, but also like uh, Kristen was saying, uh, recognize their cultures and their social behaviors. So I would like to thank my collaborators uh, who have been involved in, in these projects. Uh, there are a couple of more, but couldn't fit all the slides. Um, um, so I'm also uh, open to have a question and thank the audience for listening. And I hope you found it all very interesting. Great, thank you so much, Christoph. That was really fascinating. And I, I need to check out your book. That looks really, really interesting as well. Um, yeah, so we, uh, if you have questions um, in the audience, um, we do have one question. Uh, my grad student, Ileana Hadjiandru had to leave early a little bit, but she has a great question here in the chat. Um, really fascinating talks for both speakers. Um, she's wondering about the motivated avoidance of empathizing with animals, which perhaps Christoph was implied by some of the, the information seeking work you were presenting on. I also found that really intriguing too. Um, if people are so, she asks, if people are so good at avoiding feeling the pain of animals, how can we successfully preserve their well being for basic animal physical needs, much less cultural ones? So she realized this is a broad question, but was curious if there's anything in your research or any other research you're aware of that, that could sustainably address this. Um. Yeah, I'm reading the question again to really understand uh, what the bigger uh, question there is preserved the well-being for basic. My my sense is that one one way of thinking about the question is we so with Kristen talking about you know physical needs but also cultural needs of animals. Given that people are seem to be so good at avoiding empathizing with the basic physical needs, how does that? How do we encourage people to confront that task of empathizing with physical needs? and these deeper cultural ones that Kristen was talking about in her talk. I'm yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And it's, I think it's one, it's one of the biggest questions that animal advocacy organizations are struggling with. Like, how can we make people care about animals? Um, and what we've seen in, in our research is that actually, if you highlight these cultural values uh, where there's some or form of um, expression of morality or cooperation of social, aspects to it, it does help to empathize with animals. Um, so which in, in itself um, assumes that you already recognize that animals are sentient and can feel pain and can feel suffering. So uh, in that sense, uh, both are also connected with each other. It's, um, it's just that there's so many uh, barriers there to make, to come to that stage and to actually have 
raise that awareness about these issues um, that prevents people to really empathize about um, and feel more in concern about animals, like uh, food animals in particular. If that answered the question. I mean, I know it's an unsatisfying answer because it's one that we're still trying to explore there. Um, um, like, how can we really make people aware and not discriminate between, as, especially on animals that are uh, fairly similar in their behaviors to us and like this kind of, we'll be talking about farmed animals there, uh, where we discriminate between these wild appealing animals and uh, farmed animals. Um, that on a, on a biological level, we know that there's a high degree of similarity on the, on the characteristics that we recognize as morally relevant. So it's, um, it's again, uh, coming from moral psychology, people recognize certain characteristics as being morally relevant, which so sh should not harm them. And we know from animal behavior studies that these characteristics are present in all these animals. And we see from Tristan's work that uh, this is going way down the kind of the complexity of a number of different animals. We, we see cultural behavior in bumblebees and, and, and so on. So um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a complicated one to, to make people care. Yeah, and I think one, just as selfishly as someone who's also interested in these topics and studying them, um, just the, the, the sense of competition between different animal cultures and human cultures, how that might play a role. Um, but Kristen, do you have a question? Just a question that follows up on this. I, I loved your talk, Christoph. Thanks so much. And I can't wait to read more of your work. Um, I was wondering if the um, if you've done any work on letting, like educating people about um, animal exploitation be behaviors being culturally important in a culture to see if that affects their willingness to accept the behavior. Um, because if so, then I was also wondering if educating cultures about people from a culture that there are human cultures of vegetarianism, if that also has an effect on people's um, views about not about eating animals, and then also whether we would predict that that might have some impacts on educating people about animal cultures would have some impacts on how they were thinking about other animals. I hope that all makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. Uh, I think the tricky part here again is that well we've been educating or we've been educated by uh, all these nature documentaries about cultures and animals this wild appealing animals deserve our more uh, consideration clearly so that seemed to have helped and people are typically um, supportive towards conservation programs um, as, as they see the value of it but um, once it comes to farmed animals, uh, all of a sudden it becomes more a morally irrelevant topic. So like even meat consumption is not necessarily seen as a moral issue anyway. So most people would see it like just as a, as a food product, right? So that's kind of uh, where we find all these uh, barriers again, because it's so powerful and deeply ingrained as a habit of meat consumption or other animal products that it becomes very difficult to start educating people about uh, the cultural lives of uh, food animals and farmed animals. Um, but as far as I know, I don't think there's uh, extensive research on the cultural, like education programs on the cultural lives of uh, farmed animals anyway, so. Um, yeah, I guess just to follow up, if I may, the, um, have you looked at asking Australians after telling them how important bullfighting is in Spain about their views of bullfighting in Spain, like that that sort of education process. I'm just wondering if that has oh, any no, impact, we, that no, as an intervention have. has an impact on views and if it can go one way in making a, a group approve of animal exploitation, if it could go the other way and make people disapprove of animal exploitation. Yeah, that's a very good question. We haven't, we haven't done that. We will see that this, disapproval rates are very high so very low support for these practices anyway so you almost have a floor effect therefore when it's about bullfighting and it's about whaling um, if it's not part of your own cultural tradition if it's not a salient aspect in your uh, country 
Um, so I think it could only go up then if you actually make them more understandable of like, if you kind of trying to um, frame it in a way that, uh, that, that make people appreciate this practice, which I don't think I would want to recommend doing that, <laughs> but at least that's, that would be my expectation in, in this research. Great. So there, there's a few different questions coming in. Uh, one question by Fabiola Borges de Castro is just praising the talk and just saying that it's interesting to see the link between human-human empathy and attitudes towards animals. Um, I'm just interested in knowing if there is any known evidence on the relationship between speciesism and empathy. Um, just inter this person's interested in learning more about the that topic. And I think it, it one of the fast from my perspective, one of the fascinating things about your talk was just sometimes at least I've heard people ask when it's like you ask questions about empathy for animals or empathy for empathy for robots. It's like, well, what does this tell us about empathy in the human human context? And it seems like one focus of your work really is like bridging those those links. But yes, I mean, Fabiola is interested in the speciesism empathy link, if there's other work that exists that documents that. Yeah, there is. There's a couple of studies. I haven't looked into, I think a couple of our studies would have included empathy measures as well, uh, but I haven't uh, written anything about that. But I know, um, I think you have something out there, Daryl, on empathy with animals. And um, there's this work showing that those people who are more showing greater empathy towards humans are the ones who are uh, scoring lower on speciesism as well. And um, this work that specifically focused on empathy for animals as a scale, um, that you see very strong correlations between empathy towards humans and empathy towards animals. So um, it, it clearly shows that this, there's not a trade-off between, like I don't really buy into a the idea that there's a trade of we, we can only concern to that many groups. It's typically like really driven by this individual difference variable, psychological factors, the strongest uh, um, share of the variance is explained by that um, individual difference characters. We know that those higher on social dominance are lower in empathy, are lower on um, honesty, humility in, in terms of another personality factor, um, are more disagreeable. So it, it's kind of that cluster, that personality, um, those personality dimensions that also drives uh, empathy and care about other um, uh, sentient beings, including animals. So building off that, um, so there's a number of questions. I'll try to hit them. I'll get, we'll get, I think we can get to all of them, but I'll try to hit them conceptually as they sort of segue out in the conversation. So Crystal Shackelford is asking about Basically, spillover effects. So, if, if if SDO ideology is a common core to different prejudices, might you see then if there are interventions that reduce speciesism, would those extend over and hit racism and sexism as well? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a great question. It's one of the ideas that I've been playing with because we've seen um, in some of the other work I've been doing on on intergroup contact, we see some of these spillover effects when when we can actually reduce social dominance orientation it has um, has major impacts of all the aspects that all the factors and nasty things that social dominance predict right so some of our work has looked at the links between social dominance orientation and pro-environmentalism um and and um we we know from our research on intergroup contact that there's a potential of having uh, more contact with human outgroup members it reduces it has the potential to reduce social dominance orientation which then uh, not only reduces uh, prejudice towards human outgroups, especially the ones you have contact with, but it generalizes to uh, a reduction of prejudice towards other outgroups and makes you more pro-environmentally friendly as well. Um, I mean, there's a lot more intervention studies, experimental intervention studies needed to really uh, nail that effect down and to really be confident that this is some strategy that can work um, to, to address these different social issues. The other way around, it might, it might be, it, it's, it's still kind of a, an idea that I'm playing with, but I'm not sure how easy that would be and how much people can automatically see the connection there. Um, we know that also the framing of some uh, of these effects can play a role. 
And there's, there's some studies showing that when you close the human animal defile, which can be seen as a reduction of speciesism, but more at an abstract level, rather than really um, the measures that we've used in, in but if you, if you frame it in a way that um, elevates animals to high status closer to humans and that way reduces the human animal divide, that seems to have uh, positive effects uh, on people's attitudes, not only towards animals, but also towards human outgroups and um, reduces animalistic dehumanization of uh, typically dehumanized groups. Um, the tricky bit there is if you frame it the other way around, when you threaten the status of humans, uh, especially among those who value the status of humans as a superior species, um, and bring them down to the level of animals or try to play with that, it might have opposite effects because um, people might also feel dehumanized, animalistically dehumanized by that, or just don't want to go with that idea. Um, so it, it's, it is a, a tricky thing to, to, to do so um uh, it's not a like this definitely not a straightforward answer there so just looking at some of the other questions here um so stephen dartnell just really seems to have enjoyed the session finds a correlation between renewable energy needs for farmed animals in northern latitudes and animals effects on animals and global warming climate change for all animals in which renewables could be brought into the spotlight with animal rights. Um, so I think if I'm reading this correctly, it's seeing a connection between encouraging care for animal rights with connections to broader concern for the environment and reducing carbon emissions. Um, I think it was more of a comment than a question potentially. Um, other, let's see, so other quick questions. So Maria Teresa Alvarez Mateos has a question. She says, being from Spain, she's curious about some of the data about the research in bullfighting, that, such as the ages and geographical pres uh, precedents, the participants in the research. Um, and so I think she's asking this because she, she says that bullfighting seems to be, in her view, a dying practice very far away from the interest of the vast majority of urban populations. Yeah, yeah, that's a specific question. And the, yeah, that's a good question. And that's what we, we know from public opinion um, surveys is that uh, support for bullfighting is definitely declining also in Spain. Um, but these samples, that was about like, it couldn't be completely representative, but at least it was uh, broadly representative for the Spanish population from different areas. Um, um, very much representing the age groups that we have in that you can see in Spain, uh, balance in terms of gender, and um, yeah, both from urban and rural areas. Um, and then on average, you still see uh, this uh, effect to occur, right? So, um, but I, I think the biggest lesson from this study is that like those higher on traditionalism are probably also living more in rural areas, uh, typically a bit older age groups. Um, are more um, not only like are scoring higher on, on right wing authoritarianism or more social conventional. And these, this is a, 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 a very strong predictor of support for bullfighting, even though on, on average you see lower levels of uh, support for bullfighting. So let me integrate a couple of last questions. And I wanna make sure that the two of you have the chance to ask any further questions of, of each other too, before we call it a day. Um, so Kirk Brown and also and there's an anonymous ten attendee kind of have similar questions. They're about um, veganism and vegetarianism. Um, Kirk Brown wants to know, how can your work help address the prime causal drivers of the transition to veganism and vegetarianism? And it, the anonymous attendee similarly sort of asks how behaviors can influence attitudes. So if one changes behaviors such as through, I guess, veganuary and other campaigns to encourage like changes in eating patterns, could that feed back into and lead to the development of caring and empathy? Um, yeah. All the directions, yes. Yeah, yeah, so th there's this, this is the big, these bigger questions about effective animal advocacy and effective vegan advocacy and what works and what doesn't work. 
Um, and there's more, more and more research coming up. So we we working on a couple of projects, typically um, looking at very specific manipulations. So not the bigger kind of campaigns are going, uh, but with these bigger campaigns that try to influence behavior first, like Veganuary, but Veganuary is such a massive campaign that always highlights um, all kinds of motives to reduce meat consumption, to become vegan as well. So it's very hard to know what the causal driver is there in these campaigns. Um, the, some people might actually just try it out for fun, for health reasons, and then start learning about animals. Other people um, care about animals. I said like, oh, this is actually a good moment for me to try vegan um, and are already um, low on speciesism, for instance, are already uh, on board with the animal ethics um, philosophy and then see this as a, as a good opportunity to engage with that behavior. So um, more and more from this research, we see that there's no one way to kind of change people's behaviors or attitudes and different people require different approaches really. Um, it also relates to different personality profiles there with, with people. Um, so from personality psychology, we already see that different people are um, triggered by different types of messages as well. Um, and then the other question um, related, what was it again? Uh, that was the behavior. It, it was it was basically sort of on the one hand, how to behavioral change with advocacy campaigns, how might those change attitudes, but then the reverse direction, like how does your work uh, kind of yeah. the, the causal predictors of drives towards veganism and vegetarianism? Well, we, from the survey studies we've done, cross-sectional, so no causal evidence, that we see that most vegans are by far always indicating more uh, animal ethics as the primary motivator to be vegan, right? So like this is really um, up to 90, more than 90% of the samples we have. We've like surveyed hundreds and hundreds of vegans now. It's always animal ethics. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this is uh, has to be taken for granted as the only way to trying to uh, change people behaves in the general population because we see with meat uh, eaters that they are more convinced by other reasons to start uh, changing their dietary preferences uh, such as health reasons and environmental reasons um, but the it, and because it's cross-sectional we don't actually know whether these vegans were um, causally driven by animal ethics but it's definitely the one that makes uh, current vegans to stick to veganism. So um, that's that's all we can see uh, and say about it and conclude about it. Um, and now with behavioral change, it seems like some of these bigger social norm intervention studies where people are actually kind of forced to change the behavior because there's something different in the environment, uh, whether the default option has become vegan or vegetarian so people ha just have to go with what, what is available that seems to have a massive impact on uh, on consumption patterns there so um, it definitely works in terms of selling uh, less meat in, in in those contexts and we see that with more and more, um, there's a hospital in New York has done that where the cells or the kind of the the consumption of uh, meat uh, plates have reduced uh, massively because of the default is now vegan um, and, and yeah this kind of this behavior approaches seem to have definitely a, a big promise there and I think once you start uh, combining that with information and education campaigns on the, the benefits of veganism um, people will start being convinced about um, animal ethics environmental ethics and so on so that response also sort of nicely segues and partially answers the last two questions here in the chat. One was from Sean Laurent, my colleague here at Penn State, about um, if giving people lab-grown meat options, basically, and how that might change moral concern for food-based an animals that are often used for food. But also, um, just both of the remaining questions are about from the audience or about SDO. And so do you think, Sean asked if you think people high in SDO might reject lab grown meat is like not good it is like you know typical meat um and then nella giatraku who uh the other questioner just wondered about like so the difficulties even in, in people who 
are low in SDO, difficulties perhaps in framing speciesism as a form of oppression. And like, how do you convince people that speciesism is something on a par with other forms of prejudice? Uh, yeah, that's, um, yeah, both are very good questions. So it, uh, first, the about cultured meat, we see from research that people are very hesitant to adopt cultured meat indeed. Um, and on average, even if we, um, we, we never found really, like we did some studies on that with photos of meat products, dishes basically, and some of the dishes were cultured meat, some were vegan meat and some were um, actual meat, traditional meat dishes, and then we just randomized the labels there. Um, and we, we never really found um, much of an influence of social dominance orientation there, but we did find like a number of psychological other, like a number of other psychological factors that pose much bigger barriers at the moment, like food technology and neophobia. People are very, um, are still very hesitant because of the safety risk that they perceive in these products or people still feel, and, and that's from other research, um, have that disgust reaction to its uh, uh, new products that are built in a lab environment, even though they might be eating other products from a lab on a daily basis because they're not really familiar with these cultured meat products. It's uh, it's still so we we still see a number of other um, other psychological factors that are more pronounced now. Um, and in terms of the um, social dominance, we we also see a role of kind of. Uh, the masculine value of meat there. So perceived masculinity is higher about for traditional meat than for cultured meat because traditional meat still involves the killing of an animal, which is like a, seen as one of these symbolic values uh, attached to masculinity. So from that perspective, you would expect social dominance would also uh, have some role to play, but so far we haven't found uh, very convincing evidence for that. Now the question from Nella, and thanks for that question, Nella, um, <clears throat> is, is of course a very complicated one. Uh, we see, and there's a big frustration of left-wing vegans there, like why do not other left-wing progressive people see uh, the oppression of other animals? And I think one of the key things there is that is uh, it's just the uh, social norms haven't shifted towards that direction yet. It's very slowly changing now, um, but, one of the key, and that's where the differences between this struggle for animal rights is quite different than the struggle for human rights, is that um, it's about this traditional practice involving meat consumption and dishes uh, that is far away from, uh, removed from an, an ideology of uh, social justice there. So people do not necessarily see it as a moralized issue in the first place, so, and are very hesitant there. And then we see again um, from that research line um, coming up that people are very, um, um, yeah, so the, the research on the do good of derogation and the moral derogation, um, that if you try to talk about these things in terms of morality and social justice, uh, people find that that um, want, wants to derogate the, the, the messenger about this. Um, so there, there's a number of, um, other strategies going on, cognitive dissonance strategies going on um, that is not related necessarily to ideology or work parallel um, that also need to be addressed to make to make it uh, work as a as a change of ideological belief systems. Um, and I hope that answers the question of Nella to some extent. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And Kristen, did you want to build off that or respond? Yeah, I did. I, because I wanted to, uh, I had a similar sort of question. Um, and also I got asked a similar sort of question and I'm, I'm sure we get these questions all the time. Um, and so I've been wondering to what extent focusing on the fact that um, it's typical for humans um, in most cultures to eat meat is just focusing on such a narrow part of, of the issue because we do lots of other things, as you know, to exploit animals. Um, 
rights or um, land use practices of non-human animals when we do this. And if we do, it might be a charismatic mag megafauna of some sort that we've decided is valuable, but not the ants and the bees and the termites and, and other animals that are also living on this habitat. Um, and so all of this, I think, really speaks to kind of a larger systemic issue, and that is in thinking of animals not as agents with social, rich social lives. Um, so one of my questions I had that popped up for you early on in the talk that's related to this is whether in some of these, um, these studies you've done looking at, at, you know, moral value weighting for vegans, vegetarians, and omnivores for different species, if you've also considered looking at how these different groups of humans talk about non-human animals, for example, do they use agential pronouns, gender pronouns, or do they use it to describe to non-human animals? This is something I run across all the time when I'm publishing because I use gender pronouns or I use they pronouns, some agential pronouns, and the editor just wants to change back to it. <laughs> I'm like, nope, not, not, I push back against that. Um, or language like owning animals. I think, I, I mean, I said in answer to your question, I had a dog, I've had dogs and cats. That's an ownership sort of uh, way of talking about them. You know, and I try to transition into more of a, a like, you know, yes, I've shared my, I live with non-human animals, dogs and cats. So like the way we're talking about them is so ingrained. And is there something that is much larger It allows us to think about the wild animals that whose habitat we're also destroying as well as the ones we're, we're raising for, for meat that might help shift lo these larger social opinions? Yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> that's a big issue that you raise. Well, I think that the reaction you get from these editors is the, the standard default is uh, people talk about animals as objects, right? So they are objectified. Uh, and people are not even completely aware of it, but they find it very uncomfortable to really personalize them um, and to consider them individuals. Um, and then we, we haven't done that research yet to really look at how people talk about animals, but like you can just know that the vast majority uh, of omnivores, vegetarians as well, will talk about it as uh, language prescribes basically what the social norm is in this language. Um, and only a handful, I would say, vegan advocates would um, have, have adopted now language that really personalize them, that use gender pronouns, and, and also avoid um, kind of uh, av avoid this language that tried to um, Kind of soften uh, the way these animals are are being uh, killed or treated. Like they they talk about murder and so on. Um, now, what we did do in a recent uh, research project is how people perceive others using different types of language, and that's where these do good or derogation comes up again. So we had um, participants uh, reading a fictitious. Uh, Part, like a scenario, like someone presents uh, the, or introduces uh, himself or herself in an online interaction. Um, and then they talk about what they did last weekend. And part of that involves animals, farmed animals. And then they talk about this animal either in, an, in a pretty standard way, which we call species language, or non-species language, which is the way you kind of uh, talk about animals as individuals. And um, and also describing killing animals as murdering or um, like stronger uh, expressions of morality there that you kind of more disapprove of these kind of practices. So, and, and now we see that people who adopt this type of languages are not really appreciate them as like they, they are being socially avoided and self-report ratings there, like people do not want to hang out with these uh, weirdos. And part of, part of it is probably it's because it's non-normative but the other part of it is that is that uh, moral derogation that goes on, yeah, like you, you, people feeling judged. And this is in interactions where the participants or the fictitious person introducing themselves didn't even talk about animal rights, didn't talk about diets, didn't talk about vegetarianism or veganism. It's just about talking about animals in a non-speciesist way. But participants attributed um, likelihood to be 
that this participant would be vegan much higher, of course, than, um, than that this participant would be an omnivore. And from that, you can see this triggers all kinds of resistance um, amongst omnivores, uh, and also to some extent among vegetarians. So we have uh, this, uh, we conducted this research in different types of samples, and only other vegans appreciated this. And even though other vegans were still saying, oh, this person is a, bit, is a little bit arrogant, um, by talking in a non-normative, non-speciesist way, they at least want to uh, hang out socially with this person. So um, it, it's an interesting dynamic um, going on there. And like the research on anti-veganism and anti-vegan prejudice is, is quite recent as well. So but we will be, there's more research coming out there, um, like how to, also how to communicate these values in ways that do not trigger these defense mechanisms. Thank you. That's that's great. Can't wait to see the research. Yeah, this has been fascinating, and um, uh, just being I'm mindful of what time it is and everything. Um, I would love to. Uh, I could, this is a topic I would enjoy talking about all day. Um, but this has been really illuminating. It's really interesting just to see the. Um, I feel like there's been various um, attempts recently to kind of add like the individual level empathy with animals, like books that talk about, you know, really inhabiting the perceptual abilities of different animals and trying to understand from their perspective what consciousness might be like. One thing that's fascinating about both of your talks is with your, that's the book, I'm reading it right now. Um, and uh, so with your talk, Kristen, you're going to focusing on the more cultural structural level features too is, is fascinating. And then Christoph, with your talk, focusing on group level sorts of predictors and attitudes i think adding those layers in really does add this nice um complication to just the different ways in which we might even think about the task of empathizing with animals in the first place um if anybody has any questions they did not get the chance to uh share please just feel free to email me um and yeah thank you both for taking time to be with us this has been a, a great way to kick off the series a topic that's been you know, one of the reasons I got into empathy research in the first place was these complexities of how we manage our, our relationships to animals. And so it's been great to have you both here. Um, those of you who are still here in attendance, uh, please feel free to come out to the next one in early April, the next panel in the series. And thank you both, Dr. Andrews, Dr. Daunt. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Daryl. Thanks, Daryl. It's been a lot of fun and nice to meet you, Christoph. I hope our paths all cross again sometime. Yeah, uh, I think I'll, yeah, yeah. I think I'll see you in California, Kristen, potentially in a week, and Excellent. then, Excellent. and then, Christoph, maybe I'll see you in in England for too long. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, come come down to Canterbury. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks. All right. See you. Bye bye. Bye. bye.